Welcome to DIY 360. Thanks for coming, you guys. Appreciate it. This is my longtime pal, Kimberly Gottschalk, who's visiting us today. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Kimberly, uh, I think I met you probably between 10 and 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Probably a little more. A little more? A little more than 10. Uh, the numbers don't matter. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, when I first met her, it was in the context of live performance. Uh, she worked for a long time with Sue McLean and Associates um, doing concert promotions, which that's kind of a misleading term because working in concert promotions doesn't just mean promoting like putting out the word, it means buying the show, selling the tickets, putting on the show, and if enough people show up, you make money, and if they don't, you lose money. And uh, she started her own company, uh, how long ago? Uh, four years. Four years ago, uh, focusing more on um, event production, which is the nuts and bolts of putting uh, together a show. So those are the kind of things that we're gonna talk about today, but the first thing I wanted to talk about is where, I don't even, this is gonna be fun for me because there's a lot of backstory at least that which you care to share, um, that I don't know. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, I originally grew up in Winona, Minnesota, and I moved to St. Cloud to go to college. And uh, that's kind of where I got my love of the music business. I kind of started dabbling in things in college. Dabbling at the red carpet? Dabbling. Mm -hmm. I probably went stock in the red carpet. I, more money <laughs> spent there than on books, probably, but yeah. Uh, no offense to the uh, good people of St. Cloud, but I have never had a good time playing at the <laughs> yeah. red carpet. The last time I played there, it's, two guys oh, oh. with blonde crew cuts were fighting in the alley behind the club, and I was like, fighting? Who fights anymore? <laughs> anyway, um, Winona is kind of a charming little uh, hippie artsy town on the river. Very charming. Like it's a river town. Grew up on the Mississippi. And what did you major in at uh, St. Cloud? I was in mass communications with a minor in English and international business. Has that stuff fed, do you feel like it's fed what you do for a living now? You know, I think I do. I think just the communication side of things, the entire music business to me is based on relationships. So just learning to communicate properly and in a, an efficient way and in a professional way probably did. And then I did get to dabble a little bit in like um, some TV production and I did a um, cable access music show. You may have seen it. I've <laughs> played on that. They still do it. KVSC, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Such nice people. Yeah, there. great people. But that's great. That's a great breeding ground and learning. You're not in front of a huge audience, but it's still somewhat professional. So it's it's a great way. It was for me to get my my kind of dip my toes in the music business. And so after college, then you moved to the cities. Yes, I decided I wanted to be in the music business, and now I like actually what you guys do here. There's I think there's more resources if you say people recognize that it's a business. At the time, it was 1993, I'm probably dating myself, but you didn't look in the Star Tribune and get a music business job. They don't, no. based on, you know, like I said, relationships. So I ended up, all my friends were getting jobs and I was waitressing <laughs> and I ended up getting an internship at Twin Tone Records. And you interned at Twin Tone? I did. I a didn't know that. Storied history, but I was thrilled working for nothing. But you know, Soul Asylum, Babes in Toyland, The Replacements, that was all part you of must their have had a, were you, Did you have a great time? So, oh, I had, an amazing time. I thought it was the best job ever. And my mom and dad are like, just to be clear, you're not getting paid. And they're like, no, not getting paid. But look what it led to. It did. So that was really a great, and I made a, uh, just such a great experience. But I also made a lot of, it's networking, you know, it was a lot of great people that I met there too. And what, what were your duties as an intern at Twin Tone? Well, at the time, uh, I did the Soul Asylum database for their fan club, meaning cocktail napkins and postcards, and there was no email list or anything like that. So every mailer literally was a postcard that went out and we ran all the labels uh, okay, for everything. So, and yeah, then you so drive home in your horseless carriage. I, in my horse, <laughs> yes. Like I said, I'm probably dating myself a little bit. The business has come a long way for sure, just in terms of that interaction that the artists can even have with the fans. I mean, that was, other than putting out an album and a live show and the mailer you got when you're in the fan club, I mean, it was difficult to have that one-on-one -on -one kind of interaction that I think people get now. Right, but the Twin Tone was actually a, I mean, for an indie record label, they kind of ran it as a business. They absolutely did. And that was really great for me to see too because it's a small operation, but it was also something that was local for me. So you read about all the big labels and things like that, but at the time, LA and New York were very far from my reality at, you know, at that age. So just having that right in our backyard was really kind of a big deal to me. Well, it must have been fun because you're probably a, were and are a big fan of a lot of the acts on the roster. Huge, huge. And I also, that was also one of my 
really good first music business lessons, though, is if you're backstage, don't act like you're a big fan. Of the band. You're, then you shouldn't be backstage in a That's professional. That's where I've gone wrong. Kind of, yes. Because oh, I'm always yeah. back there like, I've always wanted <laughs> to meet you, dude. I, d I, I love you. <laughs> and then they get freaked out, and I never knew why. So, yeah, downplay, downplay. So you yeah, you learn to be cool. But I did. My boss taught me, you know, you think of this. This is the band's office when they're backstage. So anything you think is appropriate in the office be appropriate back here. But you wouldn't walk up to your coworker and be like, oh my God, I had a poster of you on my wall. Like, that. it just wouldn't be appropriate. So. Who was your boss at Twin um, Tone? Keith Moran, who still runs. He's got gospel gossip. He's got, um, he still has a handful of, really good indie bands and he's got an indie label still so he never sold out to the man so Keith will be happy I said that God, I couldn't wait the first time the man <laughs> yeah. showed up with a check for me I was like where do I sign anyway I'm in um, he stayed true to his indie roots so how long did you work at Twin Tone um, so it was like a six month internship and what did you do after that and then I based on that I made a relationship and I worked for a small agency in Woodbury the music works oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. is booked, that still around yeah it is and it what is. do they do like Metal you know, bands or no? They do a lot of uh, like Coney Fairs and things like that. So the Killer Hayseeds is one of our bigger bands. Right. And okay. The Nerds. We did yeah, like I said, a lot of the State Fair circuits and Coney Fairs. So you Fairs did work with the Nerds. So I did. Can you tell us anything about working with the Nerds? <laughs> with the Nerds, they're <laughs> fabulous. I work with the Nerds every day. Yeah. <laughs> ah, uh, burn. He said it with with <laughs> affection, right? Um. And so how long did, was that a paying gig? You that got? was a paying gig. So this is actually my 20th anniversary, 2013, of having a paying gig in the music business. Well, right there. <laughs> yeah, right. Success. <laughs> That's what we're all going for in this Not going to tell you what the paychecks always were, but technically it was, it was a paycheck. So. And so um, <laughs> the Music Works is a booking agency. Yeah, so that was a booking agency. So I was on that side of things. And again, it probably behooved me to do something a little bit smaller because you get to do everything. So, well, it's always kind of cool to be with one of the big guys it's great when you get in at a smaller business level like that too because I just think you get a ton of experience I mean I did everything from booking to cold calls to all their press kits to being on site I sold merch I you know, whatever they needed really learning how it really yeah. works did and you, you advance shows and yes, stuff like that advanced shows and, and also just kind of learning the terminology in the in the industry it sort of has its own vernacular well, like the phrase advancing a show because a lot of people not in the booking world don't know what that is unless you're in a band and you have to do that for yourself. But advancing the show means, okay, you got the gig. Now, contacting the venue about when's load in, when's sound check. Uh, here's our stage plot. Here's how many people are in our band. Here's the mic setup we need. What's the PA like? What's the set time? What's the end time? You know, what do we want on our deli tray? Actually, that's not going to be a problem for a while. But um, that kind of stuff. And um, that kind of stuff might sound not very glamorous, but... It's one of those jobs where you don't notice it unless it's done. It's like a bass player. You don't notice them unless they suck. You know what I mean? And then if they suck, you're like, I hate this band. I don't know why. This show went horribly <laughs> south. We don't know why because it wasn't advanced properly. So it's super And I did important. learn that's a huge part of the, the show, especially for the band. Because nothing goes smoothly on site if it wasn't set up in advance. Yeah, yeah. And so how long were you at Music Works? That was only about two years. And then um, I got an opportunity at Grand Casinos. So I worked in the casino industry for about four and a half years. That long? It was. about four, But I was young and green, and they said, do you think you can do this? And I said, yeah, I think I can book seven casinos. I love the confidence of youth. Oh, yep, yeah, absolutely. I totally and I would always that. encourage that, too. Just if you get an opportunity, and even if you're a little bit hesitant, like, I don't know, what is it, fake it till you make it or whatever oh, the, the phrase is. Oh, I totally but, subscribe yeah. to that. I got my first mixing gig a few years ago to mix a Meat Puppets record, and the guy who hired me is a friend, but he didn't. He wasn't a very techie guy, and he didn't know that at that point I was a producer, but not a very good engineer. And when he said, "Can you mix this Meat Puppets record?" I said, "Yes, yes, I can." And then I called another guy that works here named Colt Lieb, and I was like, "Colt, I got it here." <laughs> and Colt was like, "There, there, it's okay." Well, and we did it together. And then I learned how to do Perfect it. Perfect example. Gave him oh, yeah. half the money, and it was we were off to the races. Um, so what did you do for Grand Casino? Did you book all the music? I did. So I started as the assistant booking director, and then our VP of entertainment left. And our CEO said, do you think you can do it on your own? <laughs> yes. Again, not knowing yes, what I, I was getting into. I said, yes, absolutely, I can. <laughs> and um, I did learn a lot, and that was probably a good 
breeding ground for me too because casinos have a lot of money. It is not like the rest of the music business. They have an entirely another source of revenue, which is obviously the casino. So it was very funny like having to get Willie Nelson off stage after 60 minutes. The average casino visits only four hours. So they do not want anything longer than 60 minutes on stage. Why don't they want anything longer than because 60 minutes? Because they want to maximize the other three hours in the casino. Oh, they want you to gamble, not so sit there and rock out to Willie. Rock on to Willie. So having to pull the plug on Willie Nelson was <laughs> an interesting and traumatic experience. Well, let's get into career. that a little bit. So what did you do? So He's I up there jamming. Talked to his road manager. He's like, you booked a Willie Nelson show. Dude, he'll play for three hours. He'll, but again, I was very green in the industry. He said, I only contracted for 60 minutes. Contract. But Willie, he doesn't look at those. Yeah, so well, he's, he's like, yeah, he's like <laughs> what contract? <laughs> so yeah, so he shut down the power, which... You it. what? We shut it down. He was wrapping up, but we had to. On the road again. But, but that's a very different perspective on the music business. And I also realized that I didn't, music there's an amenity, and I kind of wanted to be in the business where music is the focal point. And I, I had a great experience at, at Grand Casinos. Because yeah, those are big shows. We did all big shows. We did the Hinkley Amphitheater. We, had, we opened up Stratosphere in Vegas. Uh, we had three more down south. And oh, because it was a company that owns this casino and other yeah. casinos? Yeah, so um, that's how I booked it. Um, I booked Bill Cosby. He's the only entertainer that's ever called me. Miss Kimberly, I got a problem. I got what a was Bill's problem? I got to fly in the Camille, and I don't even know what he's talking about, his jet to Hinkley, and the, they didn't have enough runway space to get the jet in. So there I am on the phone, all of 24 years old, trying to figure out how to... what. Did so we extended the runway. You're kidding we me. We did. We paid to extend you the runway. You built out the runway for Bill yes. Cosby. But that, again, in the casino world is very different, like throwing an extra five or ten grand at it to make it happen. Because the shows are loss leaders. It's not like being an loss independent leaders, promoter exactly. where you're playing with your own money. And, and the only revenue you have is ticket revenue, you know, so every single ticket, you know, means a lot. And in the casino industry, obviously, it's an amenity to draw people in to get them into the casino, so... So you pulled Very the plug different. on Willie Nelson. You extended the runway for Bill, for Cosby. Bill Cosby. What are some of the other acts you know that you remember? Bigger acts that you booked in in those casinos? Um, we did well. A big one for me was Aretha Franklin, and wow. um, she was pretty amazing. She's just legendary. And you guys are gonna find this too as you work with. Sometimes it's almost a little daunting to work with like iconic people or people that mean a lot to you because. Sometimes it's a great experience, and sometimes it's not as great of an experience. And you were probably you nervous know, coming here you, today to you know? do this with me. Absolutely, and I yeah. thought, You're Kevin Bowe yeah. on state. I mean, I've dreamed about this. So. You're doing great, though. <laughs> Isn't she doing great? Give her a hand, people. She's doing really great. I'm definitely usually on the other side, so this is very different for me, I have to tell you. So who else did you, besides Aretha? Um, so Aretha was great, and we had, I didn't even realize how much I liked Tom Jones, but Tom Jones was great. But mind you, at the time, I was, uh, thank you, thank you <laughs> Jones, right? I was, I think it was between the ages of like 24 and 27 that I was doing this. You know, my friends are at like at First Ave or Aqua Time. My mom would come to a lot of shows with me because right. <laughs> it's really a hard sell at 26 to get your friends to come to Wayne Newton, you know. That's so, a weird world. You, you were know, in a weird world a for your age. World. But I learned a lot, and I made some great, um, again, it goes back to relationships, and I got to work with a lot of the big agents because I had big budgets <laughs> at the time. Right, right. So... Some of those people I still work with today, and they're like, oh, I can't really remember. And you would, would call us up, and you'd be like, oh, I've got 100 grand, and I need, we're like, oh, we'll get you something for 100 <laughs> grand. I mean, again, it probably goes back to being a little bit green, but. Um, That's what a great yeah. experience, though. Yeah. And you so, did, how long did you work for the casino? It was about four and a half years. That's so a long time. So you probably, by the end of it, you probably knew the ropes. Yeah, I think I did. And it also gave me the opportunity, too, if you get, like I said, just kind of when the door opens. But I got to go to some of the music conferences, uh, CIC, Odin. Uh, L.A. is a big one. It's attached to Polestar, kind of the industry bible in terms of magazines. Um, and again, once the ball kind of starts rolling, it's really great. And I, I just can't go back to relationships enough. You made a lot of friends that you still have. Yes, I do. Friends. I do. Business friends that are now some of my closest friends. And so um, I want to hear the most messed up show that you ever did at one of the casinos. What was it? What was the show where that, that went the show that went horribly wrong? Jerry Lee Lewis wouldn't put on his pants. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, we're going to back it up just a second. <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis wouldn't put on his pants? He would not. <laughs> what, can we get some context? <laughs> He'd had some liquid refreshment, apparently, before the show. And 
uh, I had a stage manager with me, and he... So he was drunk. Does he drink his liquor from an old fruit jar, uh, like the song he says? He does not. He does not? No, okay. No, that would have even been more... I know, that even would have been better, but... Um, he was drunk and we had to get his pants on him. So that we, was probably... Oh, you know what? Back it up again. Fair. We had to get his pants yeah, it on. Took a team. <laughs> it does took take a, a village to get Jerry Lee's pants on, doesn't it? Took a village. So that was kind of, again, some of those things that happen, though, you look back and it's like, oh, if I could get through that, then the next thing doesn't seem nearly as daunting. That is true with experience, like touring with Paul Westerberg. People ask, someone asked me the other day, oh, I... I played at the Target Center the other day opening for Nugent, Ario, and Styx solo. 6,500 people. Just uh, Josh from the Varsity That's called amazing. me up and said, we, Yeah, it was, it was. And p afterwards, people were like, You know, were you scared? And it's like, No stage fright, no nothing. I've already seen, you know what I mean? Once you've had wrong. to pants Jerry Lee Lewis, <laughs> right. what scares you? What's going to scare you? It's like if Godzilla showed up at your show <laughs> for reals, not like the movie, but for real, then maybe, oh, okay, right. you have my attention. But outside of that, of that, you do get to a certain point in this business where you've seen every horrible thing that can happen, and Jay has got to be like that. Jay Fleming, yeah, Jay who's running sound this, here. Actually. Yeah, we should have one with Jay because the horrible things that he's seen, unspeakable horrors. <laughs> unspeakable. Um, unspeakable. <laughs> you can't speak of them. But so Jerry Lee's pants were did um, were um, yes, hiked and up, then and he the thing is, he did a great show. Like I <sighs> would love to tell you, it was a train wreck. It wasn't. He he was amazing on stage. I think that's just how he'd operated for a long time. And and this is all like what happens at IPR stays at IPR, right? <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, nobody's. <laughs> it's not like we're filming this or recording it. Nobody's ever going to see this. <laughs> Jerry Lee. <laughs> anyway, um, well, that's not even the in the top ten list of that doesn't make it the top 10 of you know weird ass things that Jerry Lee Lewis has right. done yeah. you know <laughs> once you marry your 13 year old cousin I mean it's like you know so his attorneys are probably gone, on the yeah. least of their problems exactly so. so under what circumstances did you leave you you were were you tired of um working you were, you kind of were hinting that you were uh were tired of maybe you wanted to work with more contemporary acts and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, contemporary. And it, so it was kind of reaching sort of that point anyway where I, I was really interested in looking for something else. And I'd actually asked Sue McLean for an informational interview, and she did it with me. And I was always like, God, I wish I could work for her. And then um, the company got bought out by Harrah's, and so they offered me the opportunity. Your, your company, yep, the casino Grand Casinos company. got bought out, and so they offered me the amazing opportunity to move to Biloxi, Mississippi. And I thought... Oh, I don't know if that's really for me. And then it just so happened Sue left her partnership over at Compass and was starting her own right. thing. Timing. And it was just incredibly fortuitous timing. And we had already, I kind of had the interview with her and then we knew a lot of the same people. So I was just kind of kept popping up, you know, in front of right. her. And Once you're in the business, yeah. your name, and if, if you do a good job, you show up on time. And also, don't you think a lot of it is um, likability? Like when your name comes up, people are like, oh, yeah, as opposed to when your name comes up, they're like, oh. And some of that just goes back to reading people. And that is your calling card, your reputation in this, in this business. And I think if you sort of know your place and have respect for people and that kind of thing. But I did. I had a ton of respect for her. And, I, you know, Sue sees through everything. I'm so glad I didn't try and bullshit my way th with her either. She would have picked up on it right away. But I was like, I just always loved what you've done in the industry. You're a fellow woman. Love what you do. There's ever an opportunity, you know. And for those of you that don't know, Sue McLean is uh, a legend in a couple of different ways. She's been an independent concert promoter around here since time began, which means the late 70s, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the fact that she's remained independent in the concert promotion business because like so many other areas of American business life in the last many, many years, the story has been conglomeration, big fish eating little fish and getting bigger and um, huge companies like Live Nation and stuff have you know bought out most of the independent concert promoters uh, that ran the music business for many years and I'm not gonna say I think that's a good thing or a bad thing it's like the argument between you know what's better digital or tape it just <laughs> it just is um, and the other thing the fact that she's a woman and so I just think there's there's kind of only one Sue McLean, and so it, it is fortuitous that you were in the right place at the right time. You happened to be in this market where there was a Sue McLean at a time when she was setting up her own shop and well, getting independent from that other 
deal that she was in. I couldn't have been more thrilled. So I had the longest honeymoon period probably ever at a job. It was just a, such a great fit for me. And she's, as you know, a very good friend of both of ours. And yes. so even all these years later, she's um, my friend and mentor. But I got to jump into things like the Basilica Block Party and Music in the Zoo series. We did, uh, we do the Live at the Guthrie series at um, the Guthrie Theater. We got to be involved in the old Guthrie and the new Guthrie. Uh, she's also an independent promoter, so that meant shows everywhere from the Fine Line to First Ave to, that was before the varsity. And regional guess, things, too. Regional, Again, yeah. based on relationships, there's certain artists that will come through or would come through the Midwest, and the only person they want to deal with is Sue McLean. Now, I think a, another thing that's crept into, it's kind of interesting, it parallels in my end of the business. I remember a time in the 80s where if a band ex let their music be used in a commercial, mm -hmm. they were considered a sellout. Remember the Del Fuegos? let their song be used in a beer commercial, and they were kind of a, I wouldn't say a punk band, but they were punky out of Boston, great band. And they just completely destroyed their fan base because it was a big deal. It was like, oh my God, those guys sold out. And now, you know, you aren't even taken seriously unless your music is used in a commercial. I think That's one of the biggest things to change that was the, the, um, the original iTunes commercials. And I think in, um, in the concert industry, I mean, I never saw sponsorship when I saw Led Zeppelin at the Met Center in 76, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It was like, right. but tickets were also, f I remember tickets were $6.50, and I was like, we only paid four bucks to see <laughs> The Who last year. This is a ripoff. Um, but um, I think now the key, you, you, you can't really do a lot of these festivals and series and stuff like that without corporate sponsorship. We do the Music in the Zoo series, and sponsorship is a huge part of that for us. I mean, we spend not as much time, but, you know, a good chunk of time on that as we do on talent, just because in order to land the bigger talent, especially, like you said, I mean, just even locally, there's a lot of competition. Nationally, there's a ton of competition trying to, you know, book headliners. And we do, usually, uh, we average about 35 shows out at the Minnesota Zoo. Have you guys ever seen a show at the Minnesota Zoo? It's a it's a unbelievable an venue. It is just, it's stunningly beautiful, and the sound is Fantastic. How many people does it hold? Um, 1,500. So it holds 1,500, but you're getting acts in there that often play much bigger. Much bigger venues. So you got to make so up the difference with sponsorship. With sponsorship in order to still pay those guarantees and, and get them, um, obviously, to a smaller venue for us. But sponsorship is a huge part of that. And a lot of brands really like that alliance with music. It has to be the right fit, but we spend a lot of time, you know, selling people on that, too. And the bands. And you've done that. Yes. So you're on the, on the phone to mm -hmm. the, like the the marketing part of big companies yes. saying, hey, Pitching. you know, and what do you give them for the sponsorship? Like big banners at the show, and then a mention in all the ads. And yeah, they get a mention in the ads, and most of the time they like special things. Like we can do a sound check party with Brandy Carlisle for you. We can do a special night. U.S. Bank Flex Perks is one of our big sponsors, and they love the association with music. It really resonates with. Um, with their customers, so we'll always do like, um, trying to think the last couple years, so if someone's coming in, we'll try and tack on one night and it's a private show for US Bank, so they can, their top 1,500 customers get to come to a show and have a meet and greet and, and that kind of thing. So I think they like some of that exclusivity too, rather than just putting a banner on a stage and saying, you know, this is it. But, um, you know, they like the meet and greets, they like um, tickets, so uh. definitely, you know, a lot of those shows sell out in advance really quickly or even day of. Uh, we just did our on sale April 27th and a lot of the inventory just went day of. Well, so now the zoo has become an institution too that people are like, which zoo shows are we gonna go to this year? Not, oh look, they have music at the zoo. Yeah, uh, and I think that's years? another one too that um, Sue's been doing it. I think I've been out there with her for about 15 years. Um, but she really built it into a series. It was not profitable the first couple years that we took it over. So, and, and she knew it was an investment. You know, It's gotta get on the map and and build it, but she took that chance and it's paid off exponentially. And how many shows this, this year? Uh, I think we're new 34. That's, so In just like the booking and weeks, setting it up must be weeks, just months yeah. and months and months of it nonstop is. work. So it does, it starts, um, I get, probably the first show was booked by November last year. Oh, wow. So I don't know if you can answer this question. You don't have to say what act mm -hmm. it was, but ballpark, what's the biggest guarantee you've had to play for, pay for a band at the zoo? Probably upwards of 75, depending. 75 grand. And that's, again, not, you know, but. That's a lot. And it ranges. We do everything from great local and regional acts to, um, 
you know, obviously bigger touring acts. So 75, that's good lettuce. So that's, they earn it. That's a lot of kale. So you can't say that either. Oh, <laughs> do re mi. No, no, this doesn't mi. leave this room. Um, so, uh, okay, we've talked about corporate sponsorship. Um, I want to hear one more horror story. What's the worst horror story and funniest? Um, although I think it's going to be hard to beat Jerry Lee it's Lewis in his pants. You don't have to say names if you don't want to, but of, of since you've been at uh, Summa Klein uh, and Associates, what do you think is the most difficult show you, you know, that you had to uh, solve a problem at, and how did you solve the problem? Um, we lost an artist. <laughs> that was difficult. He wanted to drive himself and just didn't get there <laughs> for the show. <laughs> so we ended up having to move. Curfew was back and trying to locate him and apparently didn't pick up his cell phone and he and his tour manager were fighting. So there was a lot of, but I've never lost an artist. That's the first time we've ever lost an so artist. So it was a no-show. Yes. So we ended up doing it just very, very, very late. Very late. What so venue was it? Um, that was at the zoo. That was at the zoo. So I remember that. I can't remember who it was, uh, but I remember yeah. reading about it. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, that. then you just have all the customer service issues, and rightly so, you know, but technically. But you can't do that many show, shows without having one like that. I know. But you can't offer, re you know, some people left, so, but the show played, so there's really no refunds, so then you get into all the, you know, customer service and fan issues and things like that. But How many years do you think you lost off of your life from oh freaking out and worrying that night? Were you just bugging? Probably, and where do you even start to go look for somebody in Apple Valley, Minnesota? I was like, is he at the bar? Is he, I don't know what he's doing. Um, he just got lost. I got a call once from Fred, who books the state, and yes. the, I think it was the state, uh, a few years ago because Brian Adams was booked to play, sold out show at the state, um, and his plane was late because of weather. And he called me and said, can you come down here and open for Brian Adams? <laughs> Just bring an acoustic guitar. That's a great call. Though. And it was, for oh, you? I was like, hell for yes, you? Yeah. we can do that, yeah. And so I got my lap steel buddy, Andy D, who you yes. know, and we went down there and did it as a duo, and we realized, we saved the show because we realized that at the end of every song, if I was able to work the phrase Brian Adams into my stage patter, <laughs> they all went nuts. Because every time we just said Brian Adams, they would go nuts. So even if they thought we sucked, at the end of every song, I'd be like, yeah, so, you know, pretty soon Brian Adams is coming <laughs> up. <laughs> Woo! Like that. And that is a great tip. They loved us just because I do. figured out to drop the name that constantly. It probably still do. works. Watch. Brian Adams. <laughs> Summer 69. It's the Canadians. It's that Canadian it's, love that runs deeper than I, American love. You. Yeah. I think that's one thing, too, that I learned early in my career. Like, we're dealing with human beings. We're not shipping freight. We're not dealing with widgets. We're not... Sometimes, you know, uh, we've had sold-out VIP meet-and-greets, and it's like, she doesn't want to do it. I'm like, oh, I, okay. I was, it wasn't really a question for him. It's, <laughs> you guys sold this meet-and-greet, so, you know. So sometimes it's, like, cajoling and trying to massage the situation and you know but they're human beings sometimes they have good days sometimes they have bad days they're you know they've got their own but quirkiness the thing about your job is you don't get to have a bad day you can have your so bad much. day when you get home and you're done with work but i've seen you in dozens of work situations i have never once seen you lose your cool well, you're I, very diplomatic and i would you. say that's got to be a skill set you know, I know I need that as a as a, a, a producer. As a live performer, I can walk around and be as much of a jerk as I want because, <laughs> you know, usually nobody's at the show anyway, so who's going to, you know, tree falls in the forest. But at in the studio, when I'm working with an artist, especially if it's their first album and they feel like their whole life is riding on it, they, they're like this, or if it's a, a, it's a, a, a drug challenge. addict or something like that, you have to be the mom, the dad, the psychologist, the spiritual guidance counselor, the food getter, you know, and just oh my gosh, make yes. people feel good. You have to, and I think the other thing is too, like I said, they're, they're a human being. So sometimes, I mean, we had a particular band and she was crying and she was dating the guitar player and they were fighting. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're still going to have to get on stage. Like, that's a personal problem, but then I got involved <laughs> because I got yeah. on the bus and, you know, you work through it or whatever, but, um, I have a rule. I will never again be in a band where one member of the band is sleeping with another member of the band. It's not if I'm ideal. in that band, I quit. <laughs> it's not ideal. You know, I will say it's that. It's come up it's in my band, in yeah. the Okima Prophets, yeah. with Peter and Steve. And I just, I have to draw, I have to draw lines. It's, it's a real boundary issue for me. That was just quite a bit anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, 
So um, after many years with uh, Sue McLean Associates, you and um, uh, my pal Holly yes. now how, uh, started your own company. And how did that come up? How did you meet we did. Holly? Um, well, after she was working for Klein's yeah. Blue Sky. Yep. So my Management? quick storied history with my business partner is when I was working for Sue McLean, she was working for. Um, Blue Sky Artist Management, we all office together, and they had at the they time managed Johnny, Johnny Lang, Lang and, and Susan Tedeschi and Double These Trouble. These offices are right down Washington from where we sit uh, above bunkers. Yep. yep. So we kind of, we had known we'd been friends before this. We worked together there, and then um, Holly went to an entertainment firm out in L.A., and that would be the only thing that could have got me away from Sue, but I did. I, I took the job out there in L.A., so I was out there for several years. We worked together out there. Um, I got transferred back to work with a corporate client here, and then our firm, which was great, we did amazing, really cool stuff there, um, all music-based. They took a left turn into video games, and I got flown to a meeting in Dallas with GameStop, and they're talking about first-person shooter, MMO, Korean game. I'm like, I have to get out of this. I don't even know what I'm talking about. These guys know more you about guys, that than we do. Yes, yeah. I can respect that, because my boss took a left turn into video games, and blew up. I mean, his company's doing great. And um, so that was great. But then Holly and I were kind of like, oh, we, you know, we're music girls. It's what we've always done. So he agreed to let us um, take a couple corporate clients with us. And we started booking for them and Which launched like our own business. Corporate events for Target and places in big yeah, companies. Yeah, we did Target, like ESPN, NFL Players Association. Um, we did one of the Bill Clinton birthday galas, which was cool. So, um, so we don't take risk on our shows. Clients hire us to bring in talent, um, which has so been So it's back great. to the casino thing, but a little bit on a mechanical level, but with yeah. groovy music. Yes. Um, but yeah, so it's great. We do everything from kids events, you know, bands on Disney up to, we just did Diana Ross. We've did, done Coldplay. We've done, there's been a lot of bands that we've had the opportunity to work with through our corporate clients. You find it because you're not playing with your own money and stuff. Uh, do you find it less crazy making or is it I it's probably it's do but anyone here that ever meets Sue McClain she it's such an adrenaline rush for her she just loves that gambling and you can win big if you I mean she is just so well suited for that industry and I mean that's what independent concert promoters do I mean that's you take a risk and a gamble you know on every show and she just loves it she loves she just so loves it shifted the game. for you from promotion to event me. I was up event at night and it's her money and I was the one not sleeping so right I was like oh, oh I feel like I could I I don't have the stones for it yeah I couldn't I could not I do think it. very I'm few people do but she's really excelled at it and it really suits her personality but I knew that probably wasn't going to be my business model so um so we've made a, a pretty good business out of uh corporate clients and corporate events and then we actually with Sue have partnered up and we take some calculated risks on some events of our own um, here and there. But, but most of what you do now is not promotion some per se, but event production. So putting the thing together, you hire security, hire the yep. uh, sound reinforcement company. Yep. So our stuff usually is all to do with the stage. So when someone's like, do you like the centerpieces? I'm like, no, nah, not my call. That's probably somebody else. But um, so anything having to do with the stage or performance, uh, we usually come in and handle. And sometimes they ask us to book the talent, and sometimes they just get a 45-page writer, and they're like, can you just come in and handle it? Like, we just take it off And the plate. events you do are local, regional, national? Mostly national. So we do a couple things here in Minneapolis, but mostly it's around the nation. Like with our corporate clients, um, it's like probably they like to choose like maybe their top 12 markets or 15 markets to do things. So you're in. traveling a lot? Yeah. Because you got to be there gotta when be the there. show goes down. Got to be there. So, yeah. But it's good. It's a fun business. I mean... And I love that you guys are getting more structure to it. I sort of fell into it, and there wasn't really programs like this when I was was coming right. up. So I think this is just a much more strategic way to do it and a quicker way to network and and just get your feet wet, too. I mean, having people like Kevin, I do have to say, you, you're you in this industry. Kevin is iconic. <laughs> you are. I've worked with Kevin for I'm many, many, years. I'm actually laconic. <laughs> laconic. <laughs> laconic. It's different. So, but this this business you have now, this is you and Holly, and you own, you two are the only We partners. do. We keep an office in L.A. and an office here, go back and forth, and then wherever our client needs us. We do quite a bit in New York. We do a lot in Memphis. Um, Memphis is a cool town, but it really does uh, smell bad there a lot. I know. Do you know what we get to do, it's though? Uh, this is one of my favorite things of the whole year. Target brings us in to do um, the carnivals down at St. Jude Children's Hospital. So we bring in uh, the entertainment down there five times a year. So that's one of my favorite things. 
uh, to do. We There's just such a nice, rewarding way to do things because we kind of laugh, but sometimes backstage, you know, someone's yelling at you. It's like, I said Avian, not Dasani. And I'm like, oh my God. Then you go down to St. Jude and, you know, you just get some perspective and these kids are, and their families are so gracious about, you know, getting to meet, um, you know, the artists. And we've had everyone from Winona to the American Idols we bring down, Jordan Sparks we just had, um, Kev Moe came. And then not only do these guys, a lot of the entertainers uh, take a pretty big pay cut to do this, Kev Moe took the tour and wrote a check. And so it's pretty amazing. He is a cool yeah. guy. Just a really great feel good kind of kind of thing for us to do. But um, It's yeah. funny how the, the, uh, a lot of the bigger artists, there really is a range. There's some of them like Kev Moe who's just, everyone who knows a guy, knows that he's a just a generous spirit and just like really just good natured nice guy. guy. And then there's other ones that are just so <laughs> darn difficult <laughs> and thorny. I know. And after this many years, I kind of have a little bit of a theory. Like I think there's some inherent qualities in people. And so like some of these people would probably just be difficult if they were your mail carrier or your insurance guy or a rock star. Like they just probably but you add be ten million dollars and a bunch of dope to a crazy. Exactly. You know, so if you already have some of those kind of inherent qualities, then you add in, you know, all those layers of being a rock star, then some of those things probably get magnified. But I think it goes the other way too, that there's just some people there, you know what, they're like you said, Kevmo is just good natured. He's a nice yeah. guy. He does what he loves. I mean, again, I think it just goes back to whatever he was gonna do in life, he was probably gonna enjoy it and just be an affable, really cool guy, you know. So yeah. So but, some of that probably But those days are nice when you're doing an event with or it's with really I'm nice producing a record. <laughs> like I'm producing a record right now with Communist Daughter. And every single person in the band is so talented and so even tempered and sweet that I feel I like think. I'm getting paid to do this because I'm and not going to name feeling. names, but you know, yeah. if you look at my discography and you're not an idiot, you'll be able to figure <laughs> it out. I've worked with some people that are really, really difficult, and um, it's uh, you, man, you really, it, it you really got to be like quick it's on your feet hard. emotionally. It's hard, I know. Well, I worked with. I'm a huge Blondie fan, and um, we did a Deborah Harry event at the Guthrie, I think it was. It was years ago with the No Exit Tour, but that is probably one of the only shows I lost sleep before. I was just like, what? oh my gosh. Heart of Glass was like the first single I ever bought with my babysitting money, whatever. But just, she couldn't have been a more lovely woman. And Yeah, she's supposed you know, to be great. Yeah, she was just great to work with. And But I again, you just keep band. it, like, I can't get things signed. Like, we're working, you know, so you don't get your pictures taken. You don't, like, none of that. So it was nice to meet her on a professional level. And she's like, thanks for the great show. I really appreciate, you know everything but then there's moments like that that I'm like I have the best job in the yeah, world. Yeah I know I love those days I do. Yeah. Um, so some of you guys must be interested in um, this line of work. Do you guys have any questions for Kimberly because she will tell you this she'll give you the straight dope. Any guys interested in uh, booking or event production or, or event promotion or anything? There's one. If you ask the question I'm going to repeat it so we get it on the video feed too. What's your question? You asked the question, then I'm going to repeat the question like an idiot so that we get it on the video feed. Say it loud. You work for Avex, which does I event know production? I know Ryan. Yay. Yes, I love him. Oh, that's, oh, that is a great end. Actually, I'm using Ryan on a Target event next month. So do you have a question about uh, the future, your future in that in that industry that Kimberly can help you with? Which is a. Uh, which is more de demanding, purely musical events or corporate events? You know, I would say the corporate events we love doing. Obviously, I built a business on it. It is a little bit different because sometimes you have to explain to the band. Like, the band usually controls the show. Like, if when I have a band coming out to the zoo, the focal point of the whole event is obviously the headliner. The corporate event, the band is mixed in under the umbrella of a whole bigger event. So when they're like, we want to change sound check to this, this, and that, well, I've got speakers on stage doing this, or they're going to do a keynote, or they're going to mm. give an award, or they're going to do whatever. So sometimes I think it's a little bit trickier, just kind of trying to 
have the band on and actually it's not even like I try and get them to understand it's not necessarily that it's just that I try and work them in as much as I can in terms of what they want to happen during the day and try and work the other components around it but I think you'll find that working working corporate events it's a little bit hard because the band wants to come in and set up and do that and I'm like well oh, they've got a video feed going for this and they're taping this and they're you know so I think that's a little bit trickier than probably just doing a straight ahead concert. it's hard to understand it if, unless you've experienced it because I've you know, I've never worked for a corporation really directly in, in that world, in the corporate world in my life. And just a year ago, Allison and I, as a duo, got a gig playing at Ameriprises, one of their big events. And I mean, I had no idea the level of uh, like what you're working on with these corporate events. We went to Denver and they had the whole convention center rented out for days and they had street parties. They had <laughs> like 30 different musical acts booked. They had, they they rented out Red Rocks f for one of their things, and this is just for Amazing. all the Ameriprise financial advisors. Like the top producers get together and they basically throw them a party and get them drunk for three days, <laughs> and then throw in some seminars, you know, during the day to justify it. I've never seen the money was flowing like Sodom and Gomorrah. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, there was like, you know, they had hired real flying unicorns to like fly yeah. over the stage and. <laughs> You know, all these things going on. I've, I, I, and we get out and did our little, you know, our little duo thing, and we were just like one one hundredth of the whole thing. But I had no idea this whole world existed, and you wouldn't unless you were involved in corporate in America. Corporate. But it's it's huge. Well, and I do think that's what you'll find too on the production side that the corporate events you do are probably going to have a different production budget just because there's so many other things you going think? on. <laughs> then, just like you said, the level of production that you guys are probably going to do on those corporate events is going to be just stratospherically different than, you know, what I can probably afford Real to unicorns. do. Real unicorns. Yes. Real ones. And I do not doubt you. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, but I think it'll be interesting for you to see. And that's a great company. So again, that's just, I think that's there you go. not only a great experience, but yeah, great networking. Who's got another question? I thought saw one over here in this general area. Give me a question now or I will fail you. I'm not going to have to. Wallen, you have, oh no, there's a question in the back. Yay. Before I start threatening individual students. Yeah. <laughs> What's the question? You know, oh, how do you charge for it, what you do? To be Good honest, it, it varies widely <laughs> depending upon the scope of what we do. So sometimes we'll just be a percentage of the budgets we manage. Sometimes it'll be a flat fee. Sometimes the, depending upon um, the client, they may want us to do it hourly. So that is, that's a good question because that is constantly in flux and that's probably dependent even, not even necessarily client by client, but probably gig by gig. Um, so, and we've gotten a little bit better. I think we probably shortchanged ourselves a little bit. I was like, oh my gosh, I'll be working for like negative 75 cents an hour by the time I finish this gig. So we had to kind of get a handle on to um, how to bid it out. Exactly. How to bid it tricky, out and how to actually. pitch. And you know, that's a negotiation. And I also realized when I started my own company, like I really haven't done sales and you really sort of get steeped in sales. You're selling yourself but it's still kind of sales oriented, you know? Do you negotiate those fees or does Holly or do you do I it together? I usually negotiate. You do Actually, that. yeah, we, we're a pretty good team and stuff like that. So, and her, um, we just have, <laughs> one of our clients called us complimentary and interchangeable. So, so we can both do everything, but her strength is way more on the production side. Mine's way more marketing and uh, sponsorship and stuff like that. And then mm. we both do the talent relations and booking. But then the other stuff kind of, you know, offshoots into either of our camps. So it's a it's a good division of labor, I think. Are you guys busy enough at this point where you're uh, you're getting as much work as you want? And are you turning down gigs or do you yeah, still we're wanting more clients? Probably getting because that's the other thing too, without we have some great contractors. So we don't have any other full time employees just because we have to travel. So we have some great contractors in New York, some in LA, some here, some Memphis. But we're kinda getting to the point too, you realize your your bandwidth just gets kind of maximized and you don't want to have to start turning down work either. Right. And we've also had to kind of like when we started, it was always the two of us on site. Always the two of us. We had to kind of almost condition some of our clients too that it was gonna be one of us and a contractor. It couldn't always be both of us because we're realizing too, we're just, we're like duplicating efforts here. Like one of right. us should be running point on different things. So some of it was just a good lesson in how to, you know, run my own business and maximize efficiency and, and profits. Yeah, that's tricky, 
tricky stuff. I suppose some of it you just learn as you go. Yeah, and well, by trial and error, and the errors are usually, you know, unfortunate, <laughs> but you learn. Yeah, so. <laughs> just try not to make the same mistake uh, twice. Right, yeah, exactly. when it comes to money. But <laughs> well, it's the same with producing records. You can, if you get, I used to do these records for a blues label in Chicago named Blind Pig, and they'd give us the budget on an all-in basis, so they give you $15,000 to make this record, and what you don't spend is your profit, and what you do spend you spend. Is you spend. And so it, it's technically possible to lose money. <laughs> right. One of those, oh, we made the love. best record. We made the best blues record ever. You know, how much money did you make? Well, we, we actually paid. <laughs> we we paid actually for some paid, of the which yeah. is not the scenario you want to be in. But no, no, it's ideally little, not. It's a little tricky. Any other questions? I think that was a good question. There's one last question here for Kimberly. How do you go after corporate you, sponsors for an event? You know, that's a good question because usually it's like I have thought some things were such a good fit and I'd sit in a meeting and these people were just blank. Like, what would you be talking to us about concerts for? So I had to kind of learn to be like, well, and now I come in with an alignment. Like, U.S. Bank is a really good example, like the Flex Perks. Like, they love the music aspect. What if we do a private show? Like, so we try and have some kind of hook for them. Like, that makes sense. And a more specific pitch. Yeah, a more than specific. Just saying, hey, we should work together. That's kind of what money. I was doing before. I'm like, oh, who doesn't think that Taj Mahal is cool? Like, you know, and that I definitely had to hone my pitches in terms of finding um, brands that it made sense. And I think it goes back to a lot of networking too. I am always pitching. I'm like, I have an 18 month old daughter, and if I meet another mom, she's like, oh my gosh, if she said she worked at Ameriprise, I'd be like, do you guys do a corporate event? Like, <laughs> I am kind of. Not always on, but there's always an opportunity. I mean, some you of my... You have your radar up all the exactly time. That's exactly how some of my sponsors and clients have happened. Just like, oh my gosh, well, here's my card if you guys ever want, you know. We do this series or that series or we do whatever. And the other thing is, like, it's a good secret, but find the music lover that thinks it's cool. Like, cause I, like I said, I can meet with a conference room full of people and they're just like, yeah, I'm really into NASCAR. I'm not really... Whatever. So I'm like, you are not my audience. This is not my audience. So if you can engage with someone, even at that corporate level, that is passionate about music, then they can start seeing the value. I right. think if someone's not very passionate about music, I think it's really hard for them. It's a big leap for them to see the the value. Uh, yeah, the value or why they'd want to be aligned so with. So you music. have to know your customer. I mean, it's like. They asked Jesse Definitely. James, how come you rob banks? And he said, because that's where they keep the money at. I mean, that's why he didn't, <laughs> right. it goes didn't back rob hardware simple. stores because there's much less money. Um, exactly. I want to thank uh, Kimberly Gottschalk for coming today, giving us a perspective on this thank industry. Thank you, you guys. It was fun. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you guys for coming. <laughs> Appreciate it. See you next week.